Slack channel for questions. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our session on speaking autistic adults to use AAC. You're at AAC in the cloud 2021. My name is Endeavor Corbin. My pronouns are their Z, and I'm an autistic self-advocate who both speaks and uses AAC. I was honored to be the community research partner last year on a research project out of Portland State University, and I'm here today with my colleagues to share with you what we learned from our study. Do you two want to introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Jamie. I use they, them pronouns. I was a research assistant in Amy Donaldson's Autism and Social Communication Lab during my time as an undergraduate at Portland State. And I'm currently working as a direct support professional for autistic individuals here in Portland. Um, I am also an alumni of the NIH's Build Exito Research Program for underrepresented students in STEM. And I'm generally passionate about both science and autism advocacy. Hi, I'm Amy Donaldson, she, her pronouns. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Speech and Hearing Sciences. And I'm so pleased to be here today and sharing the results of this study. Um, my general interests are social communication, relationships, friendships, social interaction, disability, neurodiversity. And uh, I've had the great um, privilege to uh, study these areas in qualitative and quantitative uh, research methods throughout my career. Our project focused on the experiences of speaking autistic adults who use AAC. We focused on qualitative data for this project, which means we explored these experiences through words and ideas rather than by using numbers or statistics. If you would like to read the academic article published about our results, it is in the Asha Perspectives Journal, titled Everyone Deserves AAC, with Amy Donaldson as the first author. Today we'll cover similar content to what is in that article, but in a more lay-friendly format. To give you an idea of what to expect, first I'm going to go over a couple more introductory slides with you about what AAC is and why it's important to the autistic community. Then Jamie will talk about the past articles we were able to find from other researchers that relate to our topic, explain what participatory research means and why we use it, go over the goals of our study give you information about what kinds of people who participated in our research, and tell you about how we asked them questions. Dr. Donaldson will talk about what we did with our participants answers in order to analyze and summarize everything that was shared, and tell you about the five strong themes we got out of that process. She will give examples of what our participants said that support each theme. And then you'll see me again talking about what conclusions we drew from the information we collected what recommendations our participants gave to professionals, and what our study's limitations were. Lastly, we'll have a short question and answer period. Slide. Before I go further, we just want to thank a few people. First, Diana Cervantes, who put so much behind the scenes work on helping with data coding. And of course, each of the speaking autistic adults who use AAC that participated, who we learned so much from. Our work was supported by the National Institute of General Medical Sciences of the National Institutes of Health. Slide. So first, let's just talk for a second about what AAC is. Unless you somehow ended up at this conference by accident, you probably are very familiar with what we mean. But at the least for cognitive access, I want to be sure to define things before proceeding. Augmentative and alternative communication means ways of communicating that support or take the place of mouth words, oral speech. AAC can fill in any gaps in communication where mouth words aren't enough to meet our needs. ASHA, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, says AAC includes all of the ways we share our ideas without talking. So that includes things almost everyone does every day, like gestures, facial expressions, handwriting notes, or typing on social media or emails. 
but often in the context of autism or other disabilities. When we talk about AAC, we are referring to dedicated communication supports such as picture books, letter boards, or high-tech communication devices like mine. Some people also consider their use of sign language a kind of AAC. Slide. In autistic spaces, we talk a lot about how mouth words may not be enough to meet our communication needs. Some of us are what professionals refer to as minimally verbal, being able to use less than 20 spoken words functionally. Researchers named Rose, Tremble, Keen, and Painter report that after early intervention services about 25-35% to 35 of autistic people fall into this category. Within the autistic community there is also growing awareness of the experiences of intermittent speech, unreliable speech, and insufficient speech in people with more vocabulary. One example of intermittent speech is, maybe we use mouth words almost all the time, but then we're not able to speak at all during meltdowns, shutdowns, or burnouts. Or unreliable speech means, we can produce mouth words on a regular basis, but they don't represent what we are really trying to say. In insufficient speech, we have mouth words that say what we mean but not enough to get our full messages across. These are all reasons autistic people might use AAC part-time, but it's hard to find even a mention of speaking autistic adults to use AAC in existing academic research. Jamie will tell us about that now. Slide. Yeah, so as Endeavor mentioned, there's really a limited amount of research that looks at autistic adults who use AAC. Uh, the majority of research investigating experiences related to AAC is focused on people with cerebral palsy, while research that's focused on autistic people is primarily restricted to the effects of intervention, especially for children. It's also worth mentioning that in a systematic review of studies regarding perceptions of high-tech AAC by Baxter et al., 2012, less than half of the studies actually examined the perspectives of the AAC users themselves. They primarily reported on the views of the parents or family members. Uh, we, we have seen firsthand accounts from AAC users in non-academic research, as with Hartman and Sheldon at Assistiveware, an organization that develops AAC and assistive technology. They simply asked AAC users questions about communication, such as, what is important to you in your communication and what do other people do that is helpful or not helpful this report can be found on assistiveware's website in a blog post titled just ask what can we learn from aac users they conclude five key insights one aac is universal but speech is only for some two we need to consider alternative access for all aac users three the AC user it should be central to all decision making. Four, privacy is crucial. And five, AAC is more than an app or a single system. There is one fairly recent academic article by Zisk and Dalton that provides an overview of why and how autistic adults may use AAC and gives recommendations to autistic AAC users, their families and caregivers, and to research researchers investigating this topic further. They emphasize that communication should be the priority and not speech, and that research should include autistic people as collaborators rather than just subjects. Slide, please. So one way of including autistic adults as research part partners is through a participatory research model, which means autistic people are included in every step of the research process, from asking questions all the way to explaining the data. This is a favorable method for working with marginalized populations, as it helps ensure that the goals, language, and dissemination of the research are aligned with those of the community. Essentially, we want to work with the autistic population, not work for them. And this is why we're so grateful for Endeavor's participation, uh, support, guidance in this project as an autistic AAC user. We definitely owe our success in this project to their determination and dedication to the betterment of their community. Slide, please. So with all that background, the primary aim of this study was to investigate the experiences of speaking autistic AAC users using the participatory research model. 
specifically, we wanted to learn about four things, communication choices. For example, what factors play a role in the choices one makes when deciding which method to communicate with? How does one feel about the different me methods they communicate with? Communication access. What challenges do AAC users face in communicating in various environments? How can situations be improved to support communication? Attitudes related to communication. How do values and beliefs about communication influence the choices people make for their own communication? What about the values and beliefs of others? And finally, recommendations. What advice or recommendations do AAC users have for their autistic peers, family members, caregivers, and professionals who work with autistic people? Slide. So being that this is a preliminary study and participants were recruited through social media groups, the group is small and conveniently sampled. Uh, all participants needed to be above age 18, diagnosed on the autism spectrum, and used both AAC and spoken language. Our sample included six adults, and while all of them were white, there was a variety in age, gender identities, education experience, and work status as detailed in the slides give you a second to look at that if you'd like. Okay, let's, let's move on. So in order to address our research questions, we needed to decide how to collect data from our participants. Um, back when we were developing our methodology, which simply jargon for how are we gonna do this, uh, COVID-19 hit and we were required to collect data remotely online. However, we opted for an online survey as opposed to a video interview due to the fact that many autistic adults report satisfaction with written forms of communication and that this would allow participants to complete the survey at their own pace. Uh, we hosted our survey on Qualtrics, which is a secure online survey service. Participants were asked a total of 34 questions, five relating to demographic information, which you saw on the previous slide, and 29 open-ended questions related to our research questions, which are shown again on screen. And now I wanna turn it over to Amy to talk about the data analysis and the results. Thank you. So as uh, Jamie and Endeavor uh, mentioned, the participatory research um, approach is really important in bringing this all together uh, with regard to how we um, completed this study, and, and that is equally important in the data analysis. And, and um, as was mentioned, this is a qualitative study. And so in a qualitative uh, data analysis, what we do is we gather together all of the information that was collected in those 29 um, interview questions. And, and when I say interview, as, J as Jamie mentioned, they were open-ended questions. So it was it was a little bit like a written interview in that our participants were given open-ended questions that then they were able to have the time to, to think about the responses and then write out their responses as if we um, had been sitting with them and, and, and asking a question and, and they were um, responding to us. Um, the only caveat being is we didn't have a back and forth around it. And so we were able to collect a lot of information about, about our um, research questions, about our interest in, in their experiences with communication. And, and so what we completed is called a thematic analysis using inductive approach at the semantic level. And so what does that mean? It just means that we we looked at all of these long answers to these questions. And, um, and we came in with um, hopefully a neutral <laughs> stance, not looking for a particular answer, not having a preconceived notion or a hypothesis about what we would find, but um, looking at the words, um, so the semantic level, looking at the words that folks um, use to describe their experiences. And then um, we um, looked at those words and put them into categories. So this is called in vivo coding across this data set. And we found categories um, from these codes and then um, read again and again and again. So it's a real um, repeated process where um, the coders will read the data set, um, identify the exact words. So in vivo coding is identifying the exact words that 
that folks use and, and putting them into categories that fit together across all of the different participants so that then as we do this, the, the categories um, start to fit together. We, um, we find themes that fit together and then these themes continue to um, be minimized and, and, um, and compacted as um, it becomes this repeated process until we're refined and reviewed and organized for clarity and efficiency. And, and along the way, we double check um, and make sure that it's not our impression or our intentions that are laid on these themes, but we're actually capturing the words of the participants. So how do we do that? Well, um, we independently code <laughs> so that we're not, um, we're not um, influencing each other. We check in with our community research partner to make sure that uh, this is reflective of what the community um, is, is saying amongst themselves as well and their experiences. And, um, and we've also really tried to develop uh, the methods in a way that's reflective of what the community has already been expressing. And so there's there's multiple ways that we check in and this is called trustworthiness and qualitative uh, research. And, and so through this process, this repeated process, this iterative process, um, we were able to find five themes from the data. And here were the themes and we'll talk about each one of them, but uh, they were AAC um, is discovered um, as an adult forced choice, and we'll talk about what each of these mean, respected choices, uh, factors that impact choice, and AAC is not weird. And that's in quotes because that was actually one of the exact quotes from one of our participants. And again, that's what we did in our coding is we use the exact quotes from uh, the folks um, um, interviews that they that they talked about. So let's talk about this first theme. AAC discovered as an adult. This was really an establishing theme for us. Um, all six participants expressed this same theme. And what this meant is exactly what it says. Um, all six participants expressed that oral speech for them did not feel normal, did not feel natural and or successful. Um, yet as children, that's what they experienced. That's what they really um, used because they were not presented with really any other choices. They did not have an opportunity um, to find alternative means of communicating, alternative modes of communicating, and, and really they had to independently seek out alternative ways of communicating, and they found AAC as adults. And so a representative quote from one of our participants is here, and uh, it states, when I grew up, I didn't have access to any AAC methods. I learned about AAC methods at about 29 to 30 years old and have since started using them for myself. And I have another um, quote here. Um, this one says, I've also had trouble in the past with general communication access because I was never given the chance to try AAC until a few years ago. So there were a few years where I was completely non-speaking with no alternative method of communication. And after that, I had limited access to speech, but it was very lacking. And so I still couldn't really access effective communication. So again, this is an establishing theme for, um, for our findings because it really um, cements the idea that uh, individuals um, didn't didn't find or have um, didn't find at AC till they were an adult because they didn't have access to alternative communication as children. The second theme um, is forced choice, and this really was categorized as a challenge across the um, participants. And again, this was expressed by all the participants in our study, um, and. Um, what this speaks to is both a historical experience as well as a current day experience. And um, this speaks to people, community services, and situational contexts 
that um, really um, our participants expressed had forced um, different communicative choices on, on participants. And, and what that means is that um, uh, certain people in these folks' lives, um, certain um, service situations, particularly speech language pathology services and medical services, and, and then certain um, contexts um, really um, made folks feel like they were forced into making communication choices, uh, choices, excuse me, that did not particularly uh, be the choices they would have made if they had felt um, comfortable to choose their own communication method. And a representative quote from one of our participants was, Growing up, speech language pathologists, that's the acronym SLP, and family pushed really hard for speech. SLPs wanted to push. My family also wanted me to speak. I still remember not being able to explain what I wanted or needed, but having the image or feeling and wishing I could put my hand on someone's head and transfer the information that way. And uh, another representative, quote that we have is from a more recent example in a medical setting, and this was reported by several folks, my parents' values around communication definitely prevent me from feeling comfortable using AAC around them. Um, another participant reported, doctors require communication support people Doctors never listen without a communication support person. I need someone to validate things I tell doctors. So those are some examples of how uh, different environments, different uh, community services, different people uh, can create challenges related to forced communication choices. Um, with regard to situational context, we had participants who expressed to us that particularly around time and particularly around feeling rushed, they uh, felt that their communication choices were um, perhaps taken away. For example, one participant reported, people not waiting for me to type, being impatient, continuing to talk, or asking multiple questions while I'm still typing and processing makes using AAC very difficult. So um, perhaps on the other side, um, what, what participants expressed made communication feel successful was respected choices, uh, where success was experienced when their communication choices were respected. And this fell into two categories. Uh, the first being communication autonomy, and the second being trusted community. And uh, how communication autonomy was defined um, by, their, um, by their words was uh, choosing a mod modality that best suits the situation context, communication partner, and physical and or mental state. And trusted community was expressed as people who provide support by creating an environment open to communication choices, responsive to all methods and or providing AAC resources. So uh, a um, reflective um, quote from this category was, what makes communication successful to me is when I can use the method that works best for me in the moment and when the other person just accepts that method. And one of the things that, um, again, is similar or parallel, I should say, to the previous theme is this is both um, historically as well as uh, currently that impacts communication for our participants. And uh, when we think about trusted community, which came up quite a bit, uh, one of the um, ways that 
folks express um, trusted community is how they accept folks use of communication changes based on context. And this actually pervades both of these categories. So multimodal communication came up in this category quite a bit, how folks would feel free to switch across different commu um, communication modalities and um, that their communication partner was just accepting of this. And so um, uh, an example of this is, um, I love multimodal communication. My brain loves it. It is so much easier to communicate with multimodal communication. It is hard to try to force myself to one communication method when I can use multiple. Life is easier with multiple. Different methods have different advantages. And uh, one final quote that I wanna share from this category is um, that we heard from several participants that they had received a great deal of support and oftentimes maybe the very first kind of support and introduction to AAC from um, folks in the AAC community themselves, maybe even being introduced to AAC from for the first time from other members um, in the autistic community or in the AAC community. And, um, and that was that first exposure as an adult to AAC. I've experienced a lot of encouragement from other AAC users online, which has really made a difference. I experienced kindness and acceptance for the first time ever with my communication needs. Factors that impact choice whoop, are in the moment factors that impact decision making regarding communication choice. So communication mode at a particular time and place. And this theme differs from the previous two themes that identified long-term challenges and successes to communication choices from both historical and present day perspectives. And um, our data analysis revealed three main categories from this theme, um, mental and physical states, uh, modality features and safety and trust. So an example uh, from mental and physical states is this quote that brings up autistic burnout and um, as I'm sure many folks are familiar, autistic burnout refers to chronic exhaustion, loss of skills, and reduced tolerance to stimulus. And uh, Dora Raymaker and uh, her colleagues and community research partners um, just uh, completed a really wonderful um, participatory research study in 2020 that examined autistic burnout for the very first time in the academic literature and um, really described autistic burnout and made the very good point that for a long time, autistic burnout had not really been formally recognized. And so that's a, just an aside, that's a really great, <laughs> um, a really great, um, paper if folks are interested. But here's a quote from our, uh, from our participant. My burnout got very bad. I was fighting to get words out and it was very noticeable. I was pronouncing words syllable by syllable and getting words wrong and finding speech more tiring than before. Um, in terms of modality features, uh, modality features that um, were brought up oftentimes related to how an AAC device um, uh, could be impacted by variables that um, uh, across, excuse me, variables that could impact selection of communication methodology across different contexts. And so, for example, environmental features, um, efficiency features, uh, a lot of folks brought up things like if the environment was wet or if uh, there were uh, things that impacted time. Uh, people brought up if uh, batteries would impact use of high tech versus low tech, um, if they needed to think about 
what was going on in terms of uh, the physical needs. And so that's what came up with regard to modality features. And then finally, with regard to safety and um, trust, safety referred to participants' feelings of acceptance and comfort using their preferred communication method. And five out of six of our participants reported safety as impacting their choice of communication in particular contexts. For example, one participant reported, I do not feel remotely safe or comfortable using AAC at home. And another participant reported asking themselves the following questions before engaging with others using AAC. Who am I communicating with and what feels safe? And um, many of our participants felt safe using and talking about AAC with uh, fellow AAC users, particularly online and in uh, chat groups and um, with folks that they had met through AAC groups and autistic groups. And our final theme, um, the quote AAC is not weird, as I said, was generated by one of our participants. And uh, really this speaks to the umbrella concept of um, acceptance of AAC as communication. And this um, really circles back to our very original establishing theme, um, which um, speaks to a very antiquated and historical notion, particularly in the field of speech language pathology, but really in the field of, um, of child development. And that is um, that you know, speech is <laughs> the desired um, way of communicating. And in speech language pathology, it was taught for many years that use of alternative and augmentative communication would be a last resort. And so um, oral speech was the goal for many years. And uh, one would not work on any alternative mode of communication unless that was the very last attempt at communication. And, and so I think that one of the things that uh, we, we are seeing reflected in this last theme is this idea of um, acceptance of all kinds of communication and particularly AAC as communication. And, and this is also, of course, reflective of Zisk and Dalton's work um, in 2019 when, when they speak of this as their theme as well. So this is influenced by several factors, uh, deconstruction of ableism, uh, rejection, as we, as we said, of speech as the barometer of successful communication. And here's one of the representative quotes from one of our participants. I have a lot of internalized stuff where I feel like I have to speak, so I end up doing it more than I need to because I feel like if I don't, I will upset or inconvenience others or make things worse or make people angry. So I push it even with those I know it's safe with because it's hard to feel safe after years of trauma related to forced speech and working to overcome internalized ableism. And um, I have an another quote um, from one of our um, participants who said, I used to have negative beliefs about AAC, um, but since have since shed them, a lot of internalized ableism had been unlearned through a lot, has been unlearned through a lot of hard work. And then finally, one participant encouraged, don't shame your peers for using AAC. Don't shame your patients, students, clients for using AAC. So with that, I uh, look forward to Endeavor sharing the recommendations and conclusions we had. Thank you. Participants all talked about not getting to use AAC until adulthood and told us about significant communication successes they experience now that they do use AAC which suggests that earlier access to AAC may be helpful for speaking autistic children. Now that the participants have AAC, they said that their choice of how they communicate changes based on many factors, including modality features, fluctuating internal states, and the support or lack of support of the people they're talking to. 
so it's important for many speaking autistic ASD users to be able to switch between communication methods freely. This may be the only way they can truly access full, reliable communication. The variety of factors that participants consider when deciding what kind of communication to use show that only the individual autistic person can really tell what methods are going to work best for them at any given time, which highlights the idea of communication autonomy, or free choice. Participants gave lots of advice for professionals, family members, and peers, but the article we published focused especially on the recommendations for professionals. First of all, professionals can support autistic people by not making assumptions about who might need to use AAC. Actually, participants want all autistic youth to have access to AAC, no matter how well other people think they use mouthwords. Instead of seeing AAC as a bad outcome or a last result, professionals and families should think of AAC as a valid and normal option from the beginning. Wanting AAC to be seen as more normal is similar to the wider autistic community's belief that we should not have to try to act neurotypical in order to fit in better with non-autistic peers. When AAC is fully accepted, our communication is much more effective and we thrive. Besides just changing attitudes towards AAC, participants gave many ideas of actions that professionals could take to support speaking autistic AAC users better. For example, they talked about how non-disabled people often don't give AAC users enough time to communicate, and said that giving more wait time in conversations is one big action that would help people like them. For professionals, that means you should give longer appointment times to AAC users. Be careful in your conversations with us, and teach our caregivers and peers to give us extra time when they interact with us too. Participants also said that formal training and education about AAC use is important, not only for speech therapists, but also other service providers and even members of the public. And they encouraged professionals to include AAC in every aspect of day-to-day -day life for autistic people of all speaking abilities. As one participant said, everyone deserves AAC. Before we move to question and answer, I'll just touch on the limitations of this study and ways that our project could be improved upon if other researchers in the future investigate a similar topic. The number of people we talked to was small, they were all white, and they were self-selected. A study that could talk to many more people, selected randomly, with better representation of people of color might give more information about AAC use and speaking autistic adults in the wider community. Also, while the long answer survey format was chosen on purpose to respect the community's preference for online communication, and to give the open-ended amount of time that AAC users often find helpful for answering complicated questions, it meant we couldn't ask any follow-up questions or make clarifications. So future research using a live interview format might give more information than we collected. Slide. This is just a list of references for this presentation if you're curious. Slide. Thanks for listening to our presentation. We have some time now for questions. You'll just need to be patient if it takes me a bit to type out my answers on my device. Moderator, can you please read questions from this slide aloud to us one at a time? Yeah, so right now there's only one question up and the question reads, so as a school SLP, what are some suggestions for how to make AAC more present available for all of my students who find it useful. I don't want my students to wait for adulthood to learn about it if I can help bridge that gap.
think the easiest way to include AAC in your students' lives regardless of their neurodite or your funding constraints would be to have low-tech AAC supports integrated into every classroom, a letter board taped to every desk, a core word board on the playground, things like that. Obviously access to robust high-tech AAC is ideal, but if you don't have access to funding for that you can still do a lot with low-tech and sign language as well. I also recommend watching Sorsha Tilton's presentation about a communication accessible world from last year's conference for a cool vision of what schools could look like if everyone had access to AAC. Okay, there was another question that says, you mentioned this was a preliminary study. What's next? Amy, ideas? <laughs> yeah, we knew that one was coming. <laughs> I don't know if we have an answer. That's what we're gonna, that's what we've been starting to discuss. Absolutely, we're excited to look at what next steps will be. This is, um, to our knowledge, this is the very first study, uh, ac academic, um, study of this community. And so we have a lot more to learn and a lot more to understand um, ab about the experiences of, of this community and, and how to best support. I, I'm so, I was so pleased to hear that last question and this question as well, um, because, you know, that's fundamentally, that, that's the crux of it, right? Is to, is to um, have this, uh, have this accessibility be lifelong and, and have, uh, have all communication be accepted um, from uh, early, early uh, development on. And so I, I think that, you know, the more that we can understand folks' experiences and how, um, how we can provide uh, supports uh, early on, then uh, that will be fundamental to, to, to changing ideas about what communication looks like and to, and to normalizing all communication. Because uh, I think still a lot of accessibility challenges remain as we all know, so. The next question is, how does the AAC user educate others that they need more time to communicate? Are there resources available?
be a great question for the Facebook group called Ask Me I'm an AAC User, because it's indeed a topic I see frequently discussed amongst AAC users. One of the first things people tend to talk about is when they have apps that let you create buttons that play immediately upon one touch. You can program those to say things like, please be patient while I type, or hold on I have something to say. So I can press something like that while I'm in the middle of composing a longer message. If people are getting impatient, that is a great self-advocacy tool. A lot of AAC users also create full self-advocacy boards or folders in their devices with all sorts of pre-written sayings relating to both communication and our other rights. The late activist Mel Bags is a blog post I believe with a great example of that. But yes I think from the very first moment someone gets AAC they need to hear that it is theirs, no one else's, and they have a right to be heard and respected. And the next question is, are there social media users, especially TikTok and YouTube, who promote and or demonstrate AAC? I am not aware of anyone on TikTok. I have heard of some YouTube channels, but I don't know names off the top of my head. I can do some asking around though if you're willing to email me with that question I can get back to you. I will find the chat and type my address into it. I don't see any more questions right now. Um, so I think People are pretty satisfied with your answers. I really appreciate the insight that you guys have given us. Um, and I hope that um, you guys can continue with this research. It's been really interesting. Thank you very much.